name is uh, Philip Munoz. I'm here at Notre Dame. I'm in the political science department and uh, a concurrent faculty member at the law school. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be chairing uh, this afternoon's panel uh, featuring Timothy Shaw. Uh, Timothy Shaw is associate director of the Religious Freedom Project at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs and a visiting uh, assistant professor at Georgetown University. He's an adjunct research professor uh, with Notre Dame's Croft Institute. Uh, his writings, uh, which I highly recommend to you, uh, examine the relationship between religion and political freedom uh, in theory, in history, and in global politics. Uh, he's published in great places, including Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, the Journal of Democracy. I think you had a piece in the Review of Politics, if I remember correctly. Um, and just earlier this year, he published God's Century, Resurgent Religion and Global Politics. May I have your attention, please? Sessions are now beginning in the auditorium and room 104. Please make your way to those rooms immediately. Thank you. This latest book was published with uh, um, our own Dan Philpott, who's my colleague in the political science department. Uh, his current activities include uh, being editor of an Oxford University Press series on evangelical Christianity, democracy in the global south. Uh, I'm told you're com completing a book with James Wallace, is this correct? Uh, with the perspective titled, Smarter Than You Think, The Surprising Emergence of an American Evangelical Intelligentsia. How soon before that one's out? Uh, Professor Shaw's talk this afternoon is titled, um, March of the Jacobians, the rise and the global rise and decline of political secularism. It's my distinct pleasure to present to you Dr. Timothy Shaw. Thank you very much, Phil. And it's a great honor to uh, be part of this magnificent conference from which I've learned enormously already. The title of my talk is March of the Jacobins, The Global Rise and Decline of Political Secularism. And by right, I should not be standing here today giving the lecture I'm about to give, speaking about the decline of political secularism. It would have been inconceivable to a host of thinkers and a host of statesmen from Nehru to Toynbee, from Lippmann to Dewey, from Marx to Weber, that political secularism could ever experience anything like a decline or reversal, or that religion could ever experience anything like a rise or resurgence in the modern world. The reason that such thinkers could not believe a lecture like this would ever be given, unless by a lunatic, is that they all held some version of secularization theory, by which I mean not just the late 20th century sociological theories that have borne that label, and which have been advanced and debated, debated by sociologists of religion like David Martin, Peter Berger, Steve Bruce, and Brian Wilson. Rather, I mean the whole class of social and political theories, going back at least to the 17th century, that have held that religion should and will occupy a more and more subordinate and more and more marginal place in political society. Often formulated in terms of a public-private distinction, with the public being the realm of the rational and the private being the realm of the religious, or in terms of the fact-value distinction, with the factual corresponding to the fixed public realm of rationality and science, and values corresponding to a literally arbitrary and shifting realm of privately chosen moral and religious preferences. This broad family of secularization theories, in other words, has viewed the subordination of religious considerations to political considerations as both a positive proposition and a normative proposition as both a description of reality and a prescription for reality, as something that both would happen and should happen. The proposition went well beyond the insistence that the things of Caesar should be distinguished from the things of God and extended to the radical notion that it's the place of Caesar to decide the place of God in society, and furthermore, that the place of God in political society should be a very small one, a very subordinate one. But secularization theory has proven to be, forgive me if I set aside academic nuance, false. Or at least its core propositions, 
have proven to be false. And many of the most important and once dominant doctrines and ideologies and programs of political secularism have proven to be failures. They have not swept God away. They have not swept him into a corner. They have not swept him into marginality. Indeed, just as Alexei de Tocqueville already observed in the early 19th century, many of the very things that were supposed to extirpate or at least marginalize religion, such as freedom and the enlightening power of education, have strengthened religion. Indeed, and this is perhaps my most important point today, it is now more clear than ever that the global expansion of political freedom in the course of the 20th century yielded consequences for the power of religion precisely contrary to those that almost all observers predicted. Sociologists, political scientists, economists, policymakers, and political decision makers in every part of the world anticipated that the power of the ballot box, along with the other characteristic forces of modernity, would break the power of the priest and the power of the mullah. It is not clear in retrospect that the characteristic consequence of democratization is not political secularization, but political religionization, the deprivatization and political empowerment of religious institutions and ideologies. It is not a stretch, not a mere rhetorical flourish, to use the term Jacobins, as I do in my title, to refer to the partisans of theoretical and political secularization of secularization as a prediction and as a program. For, for, for virtually all of them were offspring, intellectual or political, of the French Revolution, that first great paroxysm of modern political secularization as a process and as a political doctrine. And for a, for a time, for a very long time in fact, these Jacobins marched on every continent, seemingly unstoppable. Yes, the Jacobins, indeed, once crisscrossed the earth in the unforgettable description of Tocqueville in the old regime and the revolution, aiming, as he said, and I quote, at nothing short of a regeneration of the human race, creating an atmosphere of missionary fervor, and indeed assuming all the aspects of a religious revival, much to the consternation of contemporary observers. It would be, perhaps be truer to say, Tocqueville continues, that the revolution developed into a species of religion if a singularly imperfect one, since it was without a god, without a ritual, or promise of a future life. Nevertheless, this strange religion has, like Islam, overrun the whole world with its apostles, militants, and martyrs. Tocqueville's prescience is astounding. For when he wrote those words I just quoted in the late 1850s, he could not have known how truly global the march of the Jacobins would become. They had, of course, already swept across Europe and made inroads in Latin America. But in the next hundred years, after Tocqueville wrote, and indeed after Tocqueville died, from the 1850s to the, to the 1950s, the world would see the rise of Bolshevism, Kamalism, and Nasserism. It would see the continuing replication and multiplication of Jacobin experiments modeled on the French Revolution in Mexico, in Spain, throughout Latin America. It would see truly breathtaking and increasingly horrific paroxysms of political secularism appearing in Iran from the 1920s to the 1960s, in China, particularly during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, and in the chilling Cambodian Revolution under the Khmer Rouge. And it would see a strident secularism assume the form of a semi-official semi ideology under Jawaharlal Nehru, the leader of the world's largest democracy, India, for nearly 20 years after its independence, who said, I'm quoting Nehru, I have no patience left with the legitimate and illegitimate offspring of religion. Or as he later told a group of students, quote, religion in India will kill that country and its peoples if it is not though carefully the word he then uses, if it is not subdued. But a march of political secularism that threatened to overrun the whole world, in Tocqueville's phrase, has, to everyone's surprise, been thrown into reverse and retreat. Indeed, one can, in retrospect, see that the year 1967 marked a pivot point, the beginning of the end of the ascendancy of political secularism. 
In that year, the leader of secular Arab nationalism, Gamal Abdel Nasser, suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Israeli army during the Six-Day War. From that point onwards, the legitimacy and popularity of secular Arab nationalism suffered a precipitous decline. By the end of the 1970s, hardly more than 10 years after Time magazine wondered on its cover whether God was dead, the Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini, born-again U.S. President Jimmy Carter, television evangelist Jerry Falwell, and Pope John Paul II, had dramatically demonstrated the increasing political cloud of religious movements and their leaders all over the world. Another 10 years later, a combination of rosary-wielding solidarity workers in Poland and Kalishnikov-wielding Mujahideen in Afghanistan helped defeat atheistic Soviet communism, which led French political scientist Gilles Capel to observe that it was more accurate to speak about the revenge of God than the death of God. In some, reports of God's demise have been greatly exaggerated. And in the field, global politics where it was expected to be most certainly predicted. We now live in an era where, when religion is a robust global force, whether in the form of Islamic revivalism, evangelical Protestantism, Hindu nationalism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Buddhist revivalism, Jewish Zionism, the list could go on. Religion, religions, religious actors, organizations, ideas are increasingly vibrant, assertive, and politicized the world over. Today I try to offer an attempt to explain both the dramatic worldwide march of the Jacobins as well as the equally dramatic worldwide, worldwide retreat of the Jacobins. First, in my account of the march of the Jacobins, I emphasize that the worldwide march of political secularism was not an inevitable or even natural outcome of modernity or modernization, the result, in other words, of, of an agentless natural process of modern maturation. Rather, the march of the Jacobins, as the metaphor suggests, was an organized, deliberate program, organized by, by particular agents motivated by particular ideas. And in my account here, I lay stress on those motivating ideas. Too often, political secularism is accepted as a kind of inarguable facticity, when in fact it represents a series of political choices and intellectual choices. And it is only when we recognize it as arising from a series of intellectual choices that we can properly and effectively engage it. Second, in my account of the retreat of the Jacobins, I emphasize that many of the very features of modernity and modernization that are supposed to foster secularization have in fact promoted the political resurgence, revitalization, and reassertion of religion. Not only does modernization not necessarily generate secularization, certainly not inevitably, it can and often does encourage the revitalization and deprivatization of religious ideas, agents, and institutions. Above all, I want to stress that the retreat of the Jacobins, the retreat of political secularism, should not have been a surprise because a precedent had already existed for religious reassertion precisely under modern auspices, namely in the history, the early history of the world's first democratic republic, the United States of America. Just as rapid democratization and modernization spurred a massive upsurge of religiously charged politics in 19th century America, the same trends have helped and are continuing to help drive a similar upsurge of religious politics in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the former Soviet Union. Consider, consider the dramatic cases unfolding even now in the Arab Spring, countries like Tunisia and Egypt and Libya, countries that are dramatically and suddenly liberalizing. Just as these societies are liberalizing, the power of religious actors is becoming greater. And even though democratization and liberalization are very incomplete and have even stalled in much of the world, political liberalization has gone far enough and fast enough in most of the world to give religious institutions and ideas at least a somewhat greater ability to exercise an independent influence on their governments and societies. And yet even where it has been the most limited, what liberalization has occurred has given many religious actors a taste for freedom and a thirst for more. But first let me turn to the march of the Jacobins. What I want to do is describe and analyze the accumulation of ideas that has made this secularist package of propositions so compelling to so many people over such a long period of time. The package of ideas that made political secularism so compelling, uh, so powerful, and such a source of political and ideological motivation for so long. 
The ideas that contributed to the power and plausibility of secularism were just what I have said, an accumulation of ideas. Indeed, the ideas that make up political secularism accumulated over centuries, beginning, as I think I've already mentioned, in approximately 1648 with the Treaties of Westphalia. And they accumulated not only a growing body of ideas and arguments and propositions, accumulated intellectual muscle, as it were, but also a growing body of disciples who were fervent evangelists, who spread the secularist message by the arts of persuasion and education, and often also by the methods of political imposition, coercion, and violence. These advocates of secularism were sometimes relatively pacific and ironic in their outlook, and in the means they favored to advance the cause of political secularism. Think of Jawaharlal Nehru in, in India, for example, relatively pacific compared to, say, Kamal Ataturk in Turkey. But they were sometimes positively Manichaean in their outlook and ferocious in their chosen means. Think of the Mexican revolutionaries, the Spanish Republicans, or Nasser in Egypt, to say nothing of communist leaders and movements. But first I want to focus on the accumulation of secularist ideas over time, which I will suggest can be seen as an accumulation of intellectual rationales, and specifically intellectual rationales for the subordination of religion to the state and to politics. The first rationale could be for, could be for convenience labeled statist or statism. This rationale for the subordination of religion to the state has a long and complex provenance. But to simplify, I think it's fair to argue that statism as a basis for secularism in the West begins to emerge in a major way in the 16th century and really takes hold in the 17th century. The basic idea is that in contrast to the overlapping sovereignties that were characteristic of medieval Europe, described, for example, by the political scientist John Ruggie, it is increasingly believed in the 16th and 17th centuries that within any given territory, the establishment of a single plenipotentiary political power is a necessary condition of peace, good order, and security. With Jean Baudin, the term sovereignty is increasingly used to name this plenipotentiary authority. And it is increasingly believed that sovereignty is indivisible, such that if a state lacks any aspect of sovereignty, it lacks sovereignty, period. A state that's not completely sovereign is not at all sovereign. Articulated by Baudin and other political theorists, it was increasingly argued for and applied to religion by a wide range of individuals and movements, including some Protestant reformers under the name of Erastianism, the doctrine that the structure and teachings of the church should be regulated and ordered by the state. One premise of Erastianism is that a church that is not under state control is apt to make dangerous political mischief. The premise was reinforced by the specter of the religious wars in France, the Thirty Years' War and much of the rest of the continent, and the Civil War and Puritan Revolution in England. All of this meant that at least some Protestant theology and bloody political experience combined to produce a very powerful consensus around statism by the time of the Treaties of Westphalia in 1648, namely a political doctrine that was adhered to by believing Christians as well as skeptical advocates of raison d'etat, that the state should not cede sovereignty or share sovereignty with any other institution, including the institution of the church or any other religious institution. Instead, the state has the authority to decide which religion should be the official and established religion in the territory over which it enjoys sovereign jurisdiction, and it has the authority to appoint religious personnel and regulate doctrine. Churches often, in effect, became the spiritual departments of the state, the junior partners of the state in the construction of social and political order and national identity. A second rationale is nationalism. As Linda Colley and Anthony Marx have noted, another rationale for the subordination of the church to politics was nationalism, which increasingly gave the peoples of Europe a source of collective identity in which religion was one supporting element, uh, nicely evoked by the title of Anthony Marx's book, Faith in Nation. Rather than promote a faith that transcends the nation, religious leaders and religious traditions in France, Britain, and the United Provinces, for example, are increasingly mobilized to promote a form of faith that buttresses and indeed sacralizes the nation, particularly in its conflicts with nations that may be defined as religiously other. So Protestantism is used to buttress Britain against Catholic Spain, France, and Ireland. Catholicism is used to buttress France against Protestant Britain and Spain against both Protestant Britain and, rebellious, and the rebellious United Provinces. And Protestantism, in turn, is used to buttress the United Provinces 
against Catholic Spain. The operative phrase here is used. To take one example, the Stadtholder of Holland, and then in fact Chief Minister for the United Provinces, Johann von Oldenbarnevelt, mobilized very effectively populist Calvinist sentiment to strengthen nation Dutch identity and resolve in the long struggle with Spain, even though personally he was not in the least religiously devout. This was but one instance of the increasing subordination and instrumentalization of religion to advance a nationalist cause. To summarize briefly, the status rationale for the secularist subordination of religion to politics insisted that religion had to be subsumed under the authority of the state in order to establish the sovereign integrity and stability of the state, as well as the good order of the church. The nationalist rationale for the secularist subordination of religion to politics insisted that religion was an essential ingredient in a strong national identity and a determined resolve to defeat the worst enemies of the nation. And as a corollary, religion should not be a source of identity that in any way competes with or undermines national identity. Both of these rationales, statist and nationalist, begin to powerfully shape political discourse, dominate political discourse and action in the West in the 16th century, the 17th century, and they both become even more important in the 18th century, particularly after the French Revolution, precipitates a further deepening of national consciousness and national self-determination across Europe. Both of these ideas greatly contributed to a characteristically modern fourfold fusion of state, faith, people, and land. Beginning in the 18th century, Though continuing into the 19th century, a third rationale em emerges for subordinating religion to political authority. Let's call this rationale rationalism. According to rationalism, society can progress only when it makes its most important decisions on the basis of reason. From John Locke's essay concerning human understanding, to David Hume's treatise on human nature, to Immanuel Kant's religion within the limits of reason alone, to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Emile, and social contract, more and more thinkers argue that superstition and tradition must be overcome by the light of reason for humanity to, pro to progress morally, politically, materially, and spiritually. They also argue that religion should be stripped of any elements that cannot meet the stringent tests of rationality. This rationalism had massive consequences for the state's treatment of education in particular. Religious topics were downgraded, clerics lost control of state-managed education, and religious instruction became increasingly private, <coughs> leading to major battles over education, of course, throughout uh, uh, the West in the 19th century. All this reinforced and deepened the accumulating secularist belief that God's place was in the home or in state-managed churches, but not in politics, not in public life, not in educational life. In the 19th and 20th centuries, two further rationales for secularism became progressively more widespread. Liberalism in politics and functionalism in social theory. Liberalism, both Anglo-American and continental, increasingly embraces the doctrine of popular sovereignty in the course of the 19th century. And this doctrine was interpreted by many to suggest that even sacred religious tradition and clerical authority would have to give way in the event that they were contradicted by the will of the people. Partly because there seemed to be no limit in principle to what the people could decide on any issue that might come before them as a matter for political deliberation, the Pope famously issued a famous condemnation of liberalism and popular sovereignty in the Syllabus of Errors in 1864. As Owen Chadwick has shown, uh, the great historian of, uh, of, of history of Christianity, this sweeping condemnation helped inspire liberal anti-clerical movements and political parties throughout Latin America and Europe. These movements and parties were determined to reduce the social and political influence of the church, and in some cases aspired to drive the church from public life altogether. Catholics fought back, of course, organizing their own political parties, labor movements, newspapers, but this back and forth, increasingly zero-sum political conflict eventuated in some major successes for political secularism, especially in France and Mexico. It's important to underscore that 19th century liberalism according to its various major versions, seemed to require the gradual attenuation of religious influence on society and the individual. And it's important to emphasize as a deep theoretical commitment, not merely as a contingent reaction to the stance of the church. Consider Hegel in the philosophy of right. According to Hegel, 
whose philosophy of right is published in 1821, the liberal state was both a unique locus and embodiment of rationality and the unique condition of freedom on earth. The organic development of the state in history was and is coextensive with the advance of liberal freedom, so says Hegel. There could be no liberal freedom apart from the full development of the state. But Hegel underscore, underscores his view, goes out of his way to emphasize his view, that the full development of the state involves the complete, must involve the complete sovereignty of the state over religion as an idea and as an institution. Only a state that had achieved sovereign jurisdictional sway over religion could be a fully liberal state. John Dewey, by the way, brought this Hegelian liberalism into the heart of American thinking on politics, philosophy, and education in the early 20th century. In the 1908 article, John Dewey explores the roots and nature of America's church-state separation, presents his own view of church-state separation, and I'm quoting Dewey. The United States became a nation late enough in the history of the world to profit by the growth of that modern thing, the state consciousness. The lesson of the two and a half centuries lying between the Protestant revolt and the formation of the nation was well learned as respected the necessity of maintaining the integrity of the state against all divisive ecclesiastical divisions. And this is the, the money part of the quote. Doubtless many of our ancestor, ancestors would have been somewhat shocked to realize the full logic of their own attitude with respect to the subordination of churches to the state, falsely termed the separation of church and state. But the state idea was inherently of such vitality and constructive force as to carry the practical result with or without conscious perception of its philosophy. Note, for Dewey, it's a misunderstanding to conceive of the American separation of church and state as just that. It is actually the subordination of churches to the state, a necessary step uh, in liberal progress. One should add that given Hegel's philosophy of history, the, the state was gradually and inexorably being achieved in its fullness. In other words, a commitment to political secularism as a normative doctrine and a commitment to secularization as, as a descriptive theory are the logical and inevitable consequences of Hegel's views. For the John Stuart Mill of On Liberty, published in 1859, the development of the powers and freedom of individuals and the expansion of the range of human possibilities require that the stifling influence of religious systems like Calvinism, which he singles out in On Liberty, be greatly reduced. In other words, only a society in which the social power of religion and tradition were greatly reduced and made subordinate to a liberal ideal of individual human development could be a fully liberal society. And of course, it's instructive to note the, the sharp contrast between John Stuart Mill and his friend Alexis de Tocqueville uh, on these matters. For Tocqueville, liberal freedom required faith, because only with faith and the mores that flow from faith can a democratic people govern itself responsibly. For Mill, Mill has the opposite view. Liberal freedom virtually requires that individuals be liberated from faith and precisely from the stifling customs and traditions that flow from faith. Finally, functionalism. In numerous social theories in the 19th and 20th centuries helped reinforce the secularist belief that religion's social and political presence would and should gradually recede as modern societies underwent economic, social, and political development. Social theorists, hugely influential social theorists like Kant, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, along with a host of mid to late 20th century theorists of development and modernization like Daniel Lerner, Walt Whitman Rostow, uh, and many, many others, have all argued that at relatively primitive, earlier stages of development, religion plays a necessary and useful role, whether comfort or social integration or explanations of otherwise mysterious natural forces. At later stages of development, as societies develop economically, and as they develop rational uh, structures, uh, political organization, the real and perceived need for religion gradually, though inexorably, declines. If religion is the sign of the oppressed, as Marx had it, then the sign will end when the oppression ends. <coughs> Such functionalist accounts of religion remain undeniably powerful even today. Look, for example, at the book Sacred and Secular by Pippa Norris and Ronald Inglehart, published in 2004, which argues that virtually the sole function of religion is to provide existential security. So religion will be powerful 
in any given society only to the extent that that society inadequately provides existential security to its members. My point in talking about statism and nationalism and rationalism and liberalism and functionalism is that all these views, which have been enormously influential among political, political and intellectual elites the world over for many, many, many decades, in some cases hundreds of years, when you add them together, when you draw them into a package, all by themselves, they generate a powerful, deeply rooted, and multifaceted doctrine of what I want to call political secularism. The notion that religions, public, and political societies should and will decline into marginality in any normal and reasonably developed society. Indeed, part of my point here is that almost anyone who held all those views, anyone who was a statist, anyone who was a nationalist, a rationalist, a liberal, and a functionalist, in the terms in which I described, anyone who had all those commitments, I think would have to be committed to a strong form of political secularism. Even if they did not think of themselves as card-carrying members of the Center for Secular Space that we, uh, some of us saw when Christian Smith uh, spoke. In fact, a strong commitment even to a few of these rationales for secularism would be sufficient to generate a pretty strong commitment to a doctrine of political secularism. And together, all these trends, these ideas, create a characteristic modern pattern of political secularism. Not in which religious actors are separated from politics. Rather, in which religious actors are subordinated to politics. In which religious actors are often drafted into the armies of the state, becoming in effect the divisions of Caesar rather than the divisions of God. So we tend to associate modernity with the dawn of religious freedom. Much of the modern era, in fact, was characterized by the rising power of politicians to limit the declining power of priests. It's important to see, by the way, that these trends and ideas were not just European in scope. They were global. They achieved global influence. Systematic modern state building occurred throughout the world, including in the budding nation states of Western Europe, of course, but also in the Ottoman Empire, the Spanish and Portuguese empires in the Americas, Tsarist Russia, the Mughal Empire in India, early modern Japan, and early modern China. Many of these ideas, though they originated in the West, quickly spread beyond the West. The ideas of Herbert Spencer, for example, greatly influenced Chinese modernizers. The financial and technological imperatives of modern warfare seem to make state building more and more necessary, and the economic windfall from expanding international trade made them more and more possible. Religious leaders and institutions everywhere increasingly found themselves on the receiving end of systematic and irresistible efforts by political authorities to subordinate them, incorporate them, absorb them into the structures of the state. In short, in vast swaths of the modern political world, Caesar made God a series of offers he couldn't and wouldn't refuse. During the two centuries between the French Revolution in 1789 and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the millennial struggle between God and Caesar entered what could be called as Jacobin fame. Caesar's proposals to God looked less and less like offers and more and more like commands and demands. Beguiled by dreams of revolutionary transformation, more and more Caesars took their gloves off, both ideologically and institutionally. And institutionally. Ideologically, they adopted ideas that favored either the elimination of religion's power and independent influence in politics and society, or particularly with, with later communist movements, went so far as to propose the eventual extirpation of religion altogether. Institutionally, though they couched their revolutionary proposals in the language of Republican separation between church and state, their intention was more like evisceration than separation. That is, they frequently enacted forms of church-state separation that barred religious influences on political life in the way one quarantines the disease, i.e. for the purpose of containing and eventually extinguishing a threat to public safety. Religious actors were not only cut loose from state support, in other words, but they saw their institutions nationalized, property expropriated, and representatives prevented from forming political parties or otherwise influencing public life. This was a one-way secularism. The traffic of control and influence could move in only one direction, from the state over to the religious sphere. Religious in individuals and institutions could not directly influence public life. There was no traffic in the other direction. 
The result was that religious actors preserved a modicum of, a, of autonomy in some cases. They could still appoint their own leadership and determine their own identity and doctrines, but lost, increasingly lost their traditional privileged access to power. These revolutionary Caesars of the left subjugated God and his partisans with the intention of weakening them. Ironically, there was also another kind of uh, secularism. A host of reactionary Caesars on the right moved to subjugate God and his partisans during roughly the same period with the intention of saving them. But the effect was virtually identical, if not in fact more enervating, for the religious actors involved. The long tradition of right-wing regimes offering support to the Catholic Church in Spain, Portugal, and much of Latin America brought, of course, the host of benefits and privileges to the church, including subsidies for church institutions and missionary activities, ecclesiastical control of education, <coughs> exclusive control of military chaplaincies. But its deep roots were some of the same secularist premises, particularly the, those of statism, nationalism, or sometimes even rationalism. And so with these benefits came secular strength. With the patronage came secular control, particularly because of the long tradition of the patronato real, the royal patronage dating back to the 16th century, in which the Spanish and Portuguese crowns exercised a wide-ranging power over the church, including control over papal communication and substantial influence over, over episcopal appointments. Pro-Catholic governments exercised similar prerogatives, even in Spain and Portugal, Franco and Salazar generously supported the church, but in a not so implicit exchange, insisted that the church remain loyal to their regimes and their policies, and that they would, and they paid a price if they failed uh, to provide that loyalty and support. So if the Caesars on the left tended to give religious actors limited autonomy, but no access to political power, the Caesars on the right tended to give them some access to political power and privilege, but really relatively little autonomy. But what happened? We know now that the march of the Jacobins went into reversal and retreat. How do we explain the fact that such surging, self-confident forms of political secularism with all kinds of ideological winds uh, at their backs, how do we explain that these self-confident forms of political secularism experienced increasing exhaustion, decline, and in some cases outright defeat? One explanation lies, I think, in that these powers overreached. In many respects, the very intensity and comprehensiveness with which diverse regimes across the ideological spectrum sought to subjugate, manipulate, and direct religious actors for political purposes soured God's partisans on the advisability of closely aligning with the state. The Caesar could not be trusted to advance God's interests in even the most favorable contexts where regimes were ideologically sympathetic to the goals and interests of religious actors, the widespread policy of active cooperation or resigned acceptance in the face of Caesar's increasingly insistent political demands had to be rethought. But a deeper explanation, I think, lies in a closer look at the society that was something of an island of robust and free religiosity while the march of the Jacobins swept across most of the rest of the world. Unlike the revolutionaries of the left or the reactionaries of the right, the Republicans who founded the United States of America respected religion, the church, God, without patronizing him. <coughs> Despite representing a broad spectrum of religious convictions, ranging from the deism of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin to the evangelicalism of Patrick Henry and John Jay, the founders welcomed God as an ally and a cornerstone of their ultra-modern political revolution. At the same time, they sought to free religion, from its historic dependence on state patronage and vulnerability to state manipulation, which they feared would debilitate and corrupt the church and state alike. Immediately after the American Revolution, Christians squabbled with one another, and some state governments, unlike the federal government, kept churches dependent on direct government financing. And at first, Christian ministers in the new American Republic were much like their European counterparts, indolent wards of the state, who nonetheless expected a decent share of social and political power, as well as the perfect obedience of the masses by virtue of their position in the social hierarchy. And yet, in the early 19th century, churches in America became less and less dependent on state support. And in the absence of state sanctions compelling church attendance, they consciously adapted their message and methods to a society that was increasingly mobile, free-thinking, and egalitarian. 
and they achieved a growing influence in American society, in large part because they were not confined by state controls or co-opted by state support. In short, the new American Republic achieved the world's first enduring model of institutional independence between political and religious authority. If the American model was not widely followed in the first hundred years after its establishment, many of the same forces and factors that helped foster religion's autonomy in America gradually affected more and more countries and religious communities around the world, scattering the ideological and institutional seeds of the American model far and wide. First, the same kind of status overreach that helped precipitate grassroots religious resistance in 18th century America compelled an intensifying grassroots religious mobilization around the world in the 19th and 20th centuries. In colonial America, as we're all familiar, British imperial overreach evoking the excesses of Charles I and William Law in the historical memory of colonial America, provoked religiously informed resistance, in which dissenting churches such as Baptists and Presbyterians played a disproportionate role. Bernard Balin speaks of uh, many of these ministers, Baptists and Presbyterians, as the ideological commissars of the American Revolution. Particularly in the, in the 20th century, secular states strove mightily to cow God's armies into submission. But they overreached. The paroxysm of secularist politics that peaked in the 50 years between 1917 and 1967 succeeded instead in strengthening the already gathering momentum of institutional and ideological resistance on the part of religious institutions to the excesses of the state. Many of the states whose secularism was most extreme gradually lost power and credibility because of their larger failures to deliver promised economic and political progress. Second, modernization spread with its attendant processes of industrialization, economic development, and urbanization. Just as economic growth and the expansion of an urban middle class in America unleashed people and resources with, with, with which new and potent religious organizations could be created, modernization elsewhere unleashed similar dynamics. Particularly the growth of educated urban middle classes throughout the world created the social base necessary for independent and dynamic religious organizations all over the world. Such people created the YMCA and the temperance movement in the US. Outside the US, they created Christian Democratic parties in Europe, Buddhist organizations like the Young Men's Buddhist Association in Ceylon, Hindu organizations, Muslim organizations, uh, a vast array of independent uh, organizations proliferated in response to modernization and urbanization. In other words, very forces that should have weakened religion, we were told, actually helped religious communities and individuals to form organization, organizations with which, through which they could influence society and politics. Third, more and more countries and religious communities caught something of the spirit of democratic grassroots populism that swept across 19th century America. Partly through the spread of nationalist and anti-colonial discourse, more and more peoples believed that it was not only right but obligatory to take charge of their political destiny. Just as Americans in the Jacksonian age exchanged attitudes of relative deference to social and political, political elites for a posture of defiance, particularly between the late 19th century and the late 20th century, political theologies preaching passivity in the face of the powers that be were increasingly considered illegitimate and unacceptable by a wide range of religious communities. Many religious communities that had one time had a mind of cooperating with various states, submitting to them, allowing themselves to be co-opted, increasingly adopted political theologies that emphasized a reassertion of the relevance of theology to public life. Even religious traditions that had tended strongly toward political quiescence and withdrawal, such as fundamentalism, uh, Protestant fundamentalism and black Protestantism in the U.S., Pentecostalism in Africa and Latin America, Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka, Shia uh, Islam, Sufi Islam in Egypt, Hinduism in India, all of these formerly quiescent, relatively quiescent religious traditions began to develop political theology that made political involvement a holy calling and indeed a divine duty. The shift in political theology created the ideological basis for independent political activism on the part of religious actors. For if globalization in the form of, Im of immigration flows and rapid communications have strengthened the independent power of religious communities in particular societies by intensifying their identity and agency as transnational communities that, as such, can more readily transcend and defy the boundaries and demands of individual nation states. 
As a nation of immigrants, the U.S. was in a sense a product of an earlier phase of globalization, thanks to which it became a religiously diverse and vibrant society in ways that had greatly affected its church-state relations. For one thing, America welcomed millions of Catholics whose largely positive interactions with and contributions to a democratic republic helped transform the attitudes of the Catholic Church to democracy and the attitudes of democracy to the Catholic Church. In similar ways, many religious communities around the world today are deeply aware of themselves as transnational and are therefore less vulnerable to being dominated by the cultural or political agenda of any one nation, state, or region. For, the, for reasons of their transnationality too, then religions can play a more independent and assertive role on the world stage. The cumulative consequence of these trends is, is the basis for the current worldwide political resurgence of religion that we are witnessing. Due to secular overreach, due to modernization, due to the spread of a, de of a democratic ethos, due to the spread of globalization, religious actors, contrary to what was predicted, are increasingly autonomous and potent forces to be reckoned with. Furthermore, since most of these trends are likely to continue if not intensify, especially modernization and, and, and increasing democratic ethos, globalization, we have every reason to expect that the political salience and political power of religious actors will not abate greatly in the foreseeable future. I do not want to suggest that religious actors will necessarily dominate every political struggle today, nor do I want to deny the power of the kinds of secularizing trends that Alistair McIntyre described yesterday. But I am convinced that those few brave souls who resisted secularization theory have been vindicated. One such person who deserves special credit, I think, is Catholic priest and sociologist Andrew Greeley. Perhaps he did not like to be told that religion was headed for the ash heap of history because, since he was a fan of the Chicago Cubs, he liked underdogs. His remarkable 1972 book, Unsecular Man, The Persistence of Religion, offered a characteristically Greelian uh, pugnacious assault on the conventional wisdom of inevitable and universal secularization. It is virtually the only book that one can find from that period that uh, actively opposes uh, secularization theory. David Martin uh, is perhaps the other person who, who did something similar. Fundamentally, Father Greeley was more than <coughs> prescient. He always insisted that whatever religious changes modernity has wrought, quote, make religious questions more critical rather than less critical in the contemporary world. We can, I think, say with more confidence than ever that he was right. It would be more accurate today, I think, invoking Father Greeley to speak of our unsecular world than our secular age. Thank you. question of your thought about the European Union. I see it as a surely a triumph of secularism and a further march of Jacobism. Uh, and I wonder whether you agree. Uh, Europe, European Union is going through something like the secularization that took place in the 1950s and 60s through Zorach and uh, Tarasco and the Murray cases. Uh, and that secular vision is being coercively imposed upon states such as Romania and Serbia. It's hard for me not to see that as a march of Jacobins. Beyond that, the control of language is so striking. Merkel, who is the head of the Christian Democratic Union, would never use the C word. She never talks about Christians. She talks about Vatican values. So there has been a radical secularization of the discourse, not only in the public forum, <coughs> but in the public space in Europe, and Pete appears to be still on the march. Your observations. I'll just make three, three points. One is, uh, yes, I think clearly Europe is an exception uh, to the, the otherwise global trend of the uh, public resurgence of uh, religion. Uh, so there's no question about it. One has to. 
uh, provide, uh, I think, particular analysis of what has happened, uh, what is happening in Europe. Still, my second point would be that there, underneath the surface, underneath the surface reporting that we all hear about Europe, there is a great deal of religious vitality, far more than I think most of us uh, hear about. Uh, groups like Communion, Communion and Liberation, uh, formed in, in, in Italy, of course, in the 1950s, and many, many other groups, uh, lay organizations, uh, various kinds of religious fraternities, uh, evangelical and Pentecostal forms of Christianity across Europe. These organizations have far more vitality uh, then I think we tend to realize. Third point, the assumption that there's been a dramatic secularization of Europe is based on often very faulty assumptions about a prior golden age of faith in Europe, which probably never existed. There's a great deal of historical and sociological data to show that Europe was never very Christianized, uh, that masses, large masses of the European population uh, were never effectively catechized or uh, really uh, educated into any robust form of Christianity. Data on church attendance in Europe in the 19th century, in ur major urban areas of Europe, uh, show church attendance at below 10%. Uh, so the idea that there's been some sort of you know, long-term decline, I think, is probably uh, exaggerated. But, but on your point, I, I don't disagree, and I, and I think your point about the European Union as a kind of juridical, uh, political, agent of a kind of aggressive secularity is, is absolutely right. I think that one should take it very seriously. I spent about two months a year in Europe, Europe, primarily in Germany. I've been going to Germany since, I'm an old man, since 1953. I wasn't making grand uh, pictures of European history, but the decline between the 50s and 19, the end of the, of the let's say, even 19, 1990, then to 2000, 2011, it is dramatic. The Roman Catholic Church has committed itself to selling 30% of all of its uh, church buildings in the next five years. I mean, there's a dramatic, at least short-term change, and which is uh, mirrored also in Italy uh, and the Benelux countries, uh, France. Yeah, no, you're, you're quite right. You're, Europe is a major exception. Yes. To what extent would you say that uh, the statism you described um, arising, I guess, in the 16th century and so forth, um, to what extent would you attribute that to uh, a, a reaction to the Reformation and the, the ecclesiastical divisions that arose from it? It's inextricably bound up with the Reformation. There's no question about it. Uh, it, statism does have some intellectual currents that are independent of the Reformation, Machiavelli, for example, uh, and, and other thinkers. And Machiavelli, by the way, is the first, I think, probably the first <coughs> open advocate of political secularism in, 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 in Christian sort of European history. He openly, in the Prince and the Discourses, advocates a posture of political secularism, openly advocates the direct political manipulation of religion to advance political purposes, uh, all the while trying to maintain a, you know, an appearance of religiosity and faith. Uh, that attitude gets picked up, but it also, in a sense, the idea that the, the state should uh, control, the, 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 the state should control the church in a kind of Cesaro Papus kind of way does get encouraged by various forms of Protestantism, Anglicanism, of course, uh, and, and Lutheranism, uh, and the very division of, of Europe into um, uh, Protestant and Catholic encourages this uh, idea. And, and, but, but also on the Catholic side, because of the pressures of the Reformation, many, many Catholic churches actually accept far greater state control over the church precisely in the, in, in the context of the Reformation. So a kind of Catholic Caesaropapism, Gallicanism in France, uh, takes place on both sides. Um, so. It, but yes, the story can't be told without reference to the, to the Reformation. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the distinction between secularism and a, a healthy secularity yeah. a la Tocqueville in terms of yeah. the, the healthy separation of church and state yes. that protects liberty of conscience mm -hmm. and that allows for the, the healthy uh, rise of, um, of religious life um, at all levels, because I mean, some of the evidence that you that you talk about in terms of the reverse of jack, uh, political Jacobism yeah. uh, seems to be along the lines of an unhealthy theocracy, 
least in some of the, the Middle East, perhaps. Right. Um, and so we wouldn't want to look at that in an entirely positive light. Yeah. Um, because that's also the, a wrong answer, I think, to the question of the proper relationship between church and state. So could you just talk about sure. that distinction? Um, first, I, I do think that statism, uh, if unchecked, almost inevitably makes it impossible to have a kind of healthy secularity. Uh, Kristen Smith mentioned this this morning in his talk. In conditions in which uh, modern states uh, presume that they have the right and authority to regulate more and more spheres of human life, uh, this kind of statist context makes it harder and harder to have robust protections of religious freedom. Because in other words, uh, Religious freedom always then appears sort of too late. It's, 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 it's an effort to carve out concessions and exceptions from an already highly expansive state authority. Uh, so religion is already sort of on, on the defensive. So I think the, as I said, uh, political secularism is a series of intellectual choices. One has to challenge the intellectual choices uh, that, that underpin uh, kind of modern ideology of statism, the sort of Hegelian uh, underpinning uh, and other kinds of underpinnings that, that only the state can provide a kind of uh, modern, rational, free uh, society. Um, so, but at the same time, I think Christians have to recover their own tradition, which I think does have a basis for recognizing a healthy secularity. There's a sort of, I, you could say there's a secularity of totality, which sees the entire uh, sphere of society as, uh, as under the kind of secular authority of the state. But then there's a secularity of limits, which, which is precisely the opposite, uh, that sees political authority as having a, a very limited uh, authority, uh, limited ultimately by, by divine authority, uh, and uh, as simply not uh, having any authority to operate in certain spheres. Uh, Christianity innovated this notion. Uh, in, in Tertullian and Lactantius, you see a kind of struggle to articulate uh, a robust kind of freedom that intrinsically limits the power of, of the state, in that, in that case, Roman authority. A radical notion that the state doesn't have unlimited power. Uh, the state can't be Pontif Pontifex Maximus. Uh, the state uh, has only a very limited power and authority. So I think we have to recover, expand, uh, deepen a kind of Christian uh, secularity of, of limits uh, of, uh, that says that the state uh, has to be under certain, kinds of, um, under certain kinds of limits. And in fact, the whole notion of limited government comes precisely from um, the, the, the struggle for libertas ecclesia, as well as libertas personae, the struggle for both church and individual freedom is what gives us the very idea of limited government. I wouldn't characterize, though, necessarily much of the resurgence that I'm talking about as necessarily theocratic. There are certainly some groups that tend in that direction. Uh, but the group, for example, that just performed well in the elections in Tunisia and Haddad, the Renaissance Islamist Party, is a genuinely, thoroughly democratic, pluralist form of Islamism, which, by the way, got 40% of the vote uh, in what's supposed to be the most secular society uh, in North Africa. Experts, you know, uh, the experts never learn, uh, but the experts told us, well, Tunisia is the one place where secularism, you know, is the most powerful, religion won't be a, a powerful force, but uh, there you see a, a religion, a religious movement that is powerful, but also not that is dangerous or theocratic. Uh, and the research that, uh, that I've done for the book that Phil mentioned, God's Century, with my colleagues Dan Popa and Monica Toff, we reviewed you know, dozens and dozens of cases of religious activism around the world in politics. Most of these cases are pro-democratic, uh, even in Islamic uh, uh, and non-Christian contexts. Certainly there are exceptions, but by and large, I think there is a striking analogy between the kind of, the, 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 the synergy between uh, kind of revitalized religion and, and democratic spirit that you saw in Jacksonian America and what's happening in, in much of the world. You see that you see a kind of push for freedom and the revitalization of religion going along together and, and, and each encouraging the other rather than there being at loggerheads. Yes? Yes. Um, I'm still wondering 
about the question, why is Europe different? Yeah. And I think this question can serve as a heuristic, perhaps, to see a particularity or peculiarity of your approach to the problem of secularization or desecularization. Um, just now, when you answered you to your question, I heard several times how you said, Christianity must. And that's different from the approach in your paper. In your paper, it seemed to me, correct me if I heard that wrongly, that, that religion was more or less a victim of what was done to it, and then it reacted against that. When I think of the issue of Europe, it seems to my mind that really the dominant Christianities, Protestant and Roman Catholic, secularized themselves very powerfully insofar as they were very proud to incorporate the Enlightenment. Today, Protestants and Roman Catholics look down on American fundamentalists and presidents having prayer breakfast by saying that we went through the Enlightenment. And that is their self-understanding, their specifically academic self-understanding, which favored integration of Christian social work into the larger um, state framework. I mean, Christians endorse that on their own. And their whole discourse of social justice, their discourse of human dignity, they have adopted a very heathen enlightenment language. So it seems to me that what you said yes. later, Christianity must recover its resources. But what do you think about that? Yes, I agree. I mean, I, I do think that you know, there is a, 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 a powerful explanation for Europe. Uh, Tocqueville, in a way, gives, gives one in the old regime in the revolution, in the early chapters, he provides, in a sense, a kind of explanation already, you know, 150 years ago. He tells us why Europe is, is sort of more secular, or anticipates the reasons why. And essentially, his explanation is, the reason that Christianity has become an enemy in Europe is not because of hatred for Christianity. It's because too often the leading institutions of Christianity have been allied with various forms of political establishment, uh, which in one way or the other, to one degree or another, have been discredited uh, in, over European history. That, that the, that the Caesaropapism uh, characteristic sort of wonderful uh, leader, well, uh, we recognize he committed human rights violations, but we often appreciate that, 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 that Muhammad, uh, the, the son and the father, Reza, both undertook Kamalist programs of aggressive secularization. Uh, the wearing of the veil was banned in Iran, uh, in public. Uh, all, no woman could wear the veil in Iran in public in the 1930s. Uh, there were violent, extreme uh, efforts to change the religious mores and sensibilities of Iran under the guise, under a kind of Jacobin secularism, under the a kind of reformist, Kamalist sort of program. Uh, this gradually encouraged an extremist reaction. Uh, extremist groups formed in response. Uh, and uh, so contexts of, of severe secular repression have often created, uh, naturally, I would say, an extremist uh, religious uh, counter-response. doesn't legitimate uh, those ideologies or views, but the fact is uh, that is what has happened. Uh, and there are, there are Christian cases of this as well. A secular repression has encouraged Christian extremism uh, in, uh, in, in response. Um, so, um, uh, in a sense, uh, there are particular reasons why in certain contexts religious groups have turned to, to violence, which have a lot to do with the, the repression that they've faced often over many decades. Yes. Yeah, you talked about this a little bit in answer to a previous question where you talked about uh, the freedom of the church uh, going along with the freedom of the individual. But it seems to me that when you look at the history in the U.S., uh, a lot of these issues were uh, Catholics or Jews or minority Protestant groups like Jehovah's Witnesses who you know, there were certain public expressions of religion on um, that it wasn't so much people who had no faith, but conflict between the different faith traditions in the country. And in order to accommodate the freedom of all of the different religious groups, a stripping away of more and more religious expression from the public sphere. So could you comment on that aspect mm -hmm. of 
secularization a little bit? I don't think that's why a stripping away has occurred in the United States. I think to the extent that a stripping away has occurred, it's uh, frankly because of the absorption of mostly European uh, ideas concerning, uh, concerning statism. John Dewey's ideas I mentioned. Um, it, it, it's not because religious groups uh, have pushed for a kind of accommodation that resulted in the stripping away. Uh, I think um, uh, various uh, minority religious communities in the United States, originally Baptist founding were a small minority, uh, other minority religious communities, uh, more recently Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, these groups haven't pushed for a stripping away, I would say, so much as uh, proper respect for their, uh, for their freedoms. <clears throat> it's uh, particular, particular Supreme Court justices who often without an adequate understanding of the context in which the religion clauses were, were forged or the reasons for uh, the formulation of the Establishment and Free Exercise Clause, uh, justices in ignorance uh, of, of the context and without uh, benefit of proper historical understanding have foisted onto the Constitution uh, kind of secularist readings which, which which any proper historical understanding of the reason for the, the, the religion clauses uh, just uh, uh, can't, uh, you know, are, are not acceptable. Michael McConnell has shown this very clearly in you know, exhaustive studies of the uh, intellectual uh, origins of the establishment and the, the free exercise clause. Others, uh, Jerry Bradley here at Notre Dame has written on these matters. Uh, so. Um, even today, the idea that there's a stripping away, uh, I think, you know, probably is, it goes too far. I think recent Supreme Court jurisprudence, while defective in some respects, has been far more accommodationist than separationist in, in, in uh, recent decades. Okay, no, sure, great. And yes, yes, sir. Just a quick footnote to Critter Delka's comments to Mark to you. I mean, it wasn't just that the people keep alienating with the Church of England, or with the Protestant Church in Germany, the wonderful book on the funeral of God shows that the major center part of the English clergy lost faith at the end yeah. of the 18th century and, and the early 19th century before the mass of the congregants lost faith. So the idea it, it deconstructed from the top down, which he indicated, there's a lot to indicate that. Edward von uh, Hartmann in his Zetzel des Christentums uh, published in the mid 19th century shows the same thing happened in Protestantism. That is, it died from the top down, not the bottom up. I mean, I don't know the history of Roman Catholicism that well, but it shows that those things happened before there was uh, people found, found themselves but, in. But then one has to ask the question, you, but you then had and, to. Which came from Kant and Hegel yeah. and yeah. from the internalization of Enlightenment ideas. But then you had a controlled experiment, though. You had the same thing happening with American clergy. Sure, we had Southern Baptists, so we but didn't have universalist views of human rights. But then, so then what's the, well, then one has to ask. The, 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 Protest, the, the, the ecclesiastical establishment in the United States was also secularized in the same way in the 19th century and in Europe. But America didn't secularize the way Europe did. Why? The reason, about, is, the, reason is, well, the reason I gave earlier is because uh, American churches were not bound, uh, bound up with uh, the uh, the political establishment uh, the way the European clergy. Uh, I mean, had you can also read that the mainline churches had a similar self-destruction. Southern Baptists didn't, even though they controlled whole counties in Texas, yeah. made them all broad. That political reaction didn't take place. It must be more complicated. They're another control experiment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is more helpful. I, I see we have one more question, but let, let me invite you to come forward and talk to... Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, please join me and thank you.